Hello everyone, Peter Harris here with Commercial Property Advisors. Hope you're doing well today. Thank you for watching. Well, today I'm going to share a quick question, but a very, very important question. And that question is, what can possibly go wrong with your commercial real estate investing? Right? What can possibly go wrong? Well, off the top of my head, I can think of six things right away. And those are one, two, three, four, five, and six, right? Quite a bit, right? So in this video, what I'm going to share with you, I'm going to do a quick overview of what can go wrong, and then I'm going to give you six ways to safeguard from disaster in commercial real estate investing. Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to start here with the question again, what can go wrong, right? Well, these things, you don't want to go wrong. They're horrible things to experience. Number one is, you don't want to experience negative cash flows. Not a good feeling, and it defeats the purpose of investing. So there are many things that can cause you to go into negative cash flow. We will get into those. I will give you a remedy to make sure that you don't get to experience this negative cash flow. Um, number two is no tenants. You do not. This is a disaster, right? You do not want to experience no tenants. Uh, what if you buy a property with no demand, you're going to have this. So one of the safeguards, I'm going to discuss this, right? Next is loan default, right? This is a horrible feeling and a horrible position to be in when you default on your loan. That means the bank is in position to call the loan or take the property back. You don't want to get here. You know how that can happen? That can happen by you, by your loan expiring and you not being ready to refinance to another loan and pay off the current loan, okay? So you don't want to be there. And next um, is having a bad property manager. A bad property manager can quickly bring you into z disaster. Seen it happen before, okay? So I'll give you a remedy for that as well. Next is running out of money. The number one cause of failure doing a renovation project of any commercial building, the number one cause is running out of money. So I'm gonna give you a safeguard to make sure this doesn't happen. Lastly, you, this is, this is the ultimate disaster, foreclosure. You do not want to go into foreclosure. It would cause so many things to go wrong with you. But to get to this point, many things have to go wrong in order for you to get, for you to get there. So what we're going to do, I'm going to lay out what the six safeguards are to make sure that you don't get to experience these disasters. Okay? All right, let's do number one first. All right, here we are, number one. The first way to safeguard uh, from disaster in commercialist investing is to have an experienced team, right? And I call this gray-haired members, okay? Gray-haired members, let's face it, this market has been on the rise for, I don't know, 10 years or so. So if you're working exclusively with someone that's been in the business for, for 10 years and they are advising you and they know nothing about the market volatility, they only know the up, you have to question what's going to happen when, you know, the something hits the fan. What Will they know what to do, right? So having an experienced team can really, really help you uh, mitigate uh, the disasters. All right. Secondly is I have a video called The Ugly Side of Commercial Real Estate Investing. I want you to watch that video. The link's going to appear. In that video, I share with you some really, really, really bad advice this person was getting from someone who was so-called experienced and how we helped that person or didn't help that person, okay? All right, and then uh, next, I wanna share with you that in, there, there is a difference between uh, commercial real estate and residential real estate. In commercial real estate, you have no seller disclosures, right? For example, if you were to purchase a home or a duplex, triplex, or fourplex, so one to four units, by law, in most states, the seller has to give you a, a disclosure, um, disclosing what's wrong with the property or what things have been done to the property and all these issues, right? Potential issues that could kill the deal, right? And they have to do this by law. So in residential, we have tons of consumer protection laws, okay? Tons of them, which is great. In commercial, no such thing, no such thing. So, this, it, so the seller does not have to give you seller disclosures if it's a commercial properties, five units above or any other type of commercial property. So it is buyer beware. That's why we have a 30-day 
due diligence period, a period of doing your homework for 30 days because there's so much to go over. So that's why you need to have an experienced team because do you know what, uh, what's, what needs to happen over those 30 days? If you don't, we do, or someone with gray hair can help you look at all of the, what we call the elephants under the carpet, okay? And there's quite a few in commercial, all right? Um, next, I want to share with you, if you if you planning on getting into commercial, or if you've been in it for a while, you have experienced all of these issues, okay? And they are, you're going to have operational issues, you're going to have property manager challenges, you're going to have contractor dilemmas, so people who are not employed by the property, like the plumber, electrician, or contractor, right? And next, you're going to have market volatility, or it's coming, right? These are what I call all inevitable. So you're going to have all of this. So if you are a beginner, can you handle all of this, right? If not, you need an experienced team, someone with gray hair to be in your team. All right? Okay. So let's move on to number two. All right, here we are. Number two is to have plenty of cash reserves, okay? Plenty of cash reserves on hand. We also call this having rainy day money when stuff happens. And when you own commercial real estate, well, when you own any real estate, stuff happens, right? You need to have the money on hand, cash available that you can quickly go to and remedy the situation and stop the potential disaster. Got it? This is just a smart thing to do, right? The number one reason of failure for when a person is renovating a commercial property, let's say they're fixing up, fixing up apartments or they're renovating downstairs a commercial space, the number one reason of failure, and I've seen this all over the country, is running out of money. Do not let that happen. Got it? Okay. Now, a, a cash reserve fund, uh, we also call this a property savings account. Okay, every property should have a property savings account. And I say here, if you do this, you will thank me later. Guaranteed, guaranteed, okay? Now, on your property savings account, it's, it's, it needs to apply to every single property that you have. Even if it's a small single family home, okay? You have your, uh, your property manager sends you money, right? And you have a checking account to pay bills on the side, right? And I'm just talking um, residential, small property. It's so much more important for commercial. On the side, you need to have a savings account uh, that we call a rainy day fund for when stuff happens, okay? Just a smart thing to do. Now, how much do you need to save up, okay? Not not a lot, but it needs to be continual and will build up to be a great amount. You're gonna start off by saving 5% of your gross income per year you need to put into your account, okay? That's not a whole lot of money. But again, you will thank me later, guarantee it, right? So you're gonna save 5% of your gross income per year every year, okay? Every year, and it's untouchable. You don't touch it until stuff happens, until you have that rainy day. Got it? All right, I'm being so adamant here because this is so important, okay? Now, I wanna share something with you. When you are renovating, right? Renovating or plan to renovate your commercial property or your apartments, what have you, uh, have all of the, the renovation money required up front. So when you, if you, if it's going to require $40,000 of renovation for your apartments, don't rely on cash flow. I need you to have it ready up front. Okay. Have all the money up front. Do not attempt, do not attempt to renovate from cash flow. Some people think, oh yeah, I'll be cash flowing X dollars per month. I'm going to put that into my renovations. Don't do it. You, you want to know why? It's going to take too long, and it's a recipe for disaster, okay? And this is about a safeguard from disaster. The safeguard here is to have plenty of cash reserves on hand and continually saved up, okay? All right, let's go to number three. All right, here we are. Number three is to have a conservative exit strategy. An exit strategy is how to get your money out of the deal. Now, the disaster that you're trying to avert is, is uh, if you are too aggressive in raising your rents or not aggressive enough in putting in you know, proper operating expenses, you could be left with no cash flow or a very, very underperforming property, which is not good for anyone. Okay? Now, here are two examples of very common uh, extra strategies. Number one, 
uh, you could want to do a cash out refi as an extra strategy. Basically, that is buying their property, right? Uh, putting money into it, getting their rents up, have it uh, worth more, and then do a cash out refinance and pull the money out, right? That's one example. The second example is you could have investors in your deal, and then your goal is to, again, buy it up, uh, buy up their property, fix it up, uh, increase the NOI, make it worth more, and then in year five, do a cash out refi and pay them back and keep the property. So very common uh, extra strategy for those wanting to do syndication. Okay, so those are two basic examples, but in either example, I want you to pay attention to the following. Okay, pay attention to these. Number one is when you're designing your extra strategy, getting your money out of the property, right, either through cash flow or sell, pay attention to the rent increases because they may take longer than you think, right? So here you are, let's say you have 24 units and the current rents are $600 and you want to bring them to $800. Don't think you can do that in one year, okay? Your spreadsheet may say one year, but actuality, you may not be able to do it one year because how are you going to get all 24 people out or get their rents up that much, right? Without them leaving or causing so much disruption that it causes you to fail, okay? Again, be conservative. Okay, number two, I want you to pay special attention to the operating expenses. I want you to consider the source. Where are you getting the reported operating expenses from? Are you getting them from the agent who is not an investor? He's, he's on this guy, he's just reporting what he has, right? Are you getting them from the seller, right? The seller may not re be reporting all the expenses. So how do you know that uh, you have all the expenses, right? I want you to consider the source, right? And how do you know is you're going to have to uh, uh, get advice from someone who's already done that. And, uh, and we at our company, we have properties spread across the U.S. And we know what the expenses are for almost every type of commercial property all across the U.S. Okay, got it. All right, next is I want you to pay, pay special attention to the vacancy rates. So when you calculate your cash flow, Right. Just pay special attention to what we call physical and uh, uh, economic occupancy. Okay. Physical occupancy. Let's say you have ten units, right, and all ten are filled, so you're 100 percent occupied, right. And so out of those ten people, uh, in this day of COVID, how many people are paying? Let's say only seven people are paying. So that's 30 percent uh, vacancy, right? Economic vacancy. So you have 100 percent occupancy. Don't be fooled by that. Ask the question, out of those 10 people, how many are paying, right? So that's your, that's your economic uh, vacancy or economic occupancy. Got it? Know the difference because that is a difference to being conservative. Got it? Okay. Next is pay special attention to your exit cap rates because they are very, very sensitive. Okay. Now, uh, when you are designing an exit strategy, uh, you're going to pay attention to when you sell the property. And you're going to project out in the future that maybe if the cap rates today in your market are six cap and you think down the road there'll be five cap, that could be a mistake. Because what you're saying is the property values all over that area are going to go up by 1% on the cap rate. That's a lot, right? So pay special attention to what cap rate you use when you're, when you're selling the property. It, you should be conservative. So if you're market cap rate right now is at six percent perhaps you do 5.8 5.75 only go down a little or don't go down at all okay all right lastly let me just say this any performa uh, information given to you not generated by your research got it by your research cannot be trusted and must be verified by a gray-haired person okay uh, just because someone gives you a beautiful performer of how their property could perform and it wows you, great cash flow, get great returns, right? And that is given to you by someone else other than uh, yourself without your research. Don't trust it yet. Do your research. Verify, verify, verify. Got it? Okay. So number three is to be conservative in your extra strategy, how you are generating your cash flow or making a profit from selling the property. All right, let's go to number four. Number four is long-term debt or long-term loan, the loan long enough to ride out any market volatility. 
Now, let me share something real quick with you to define uh, commercial loans or residential loans. You see, when you get a, a loan for your home, it is 30-year uh, fixed, right? So 3, 4, 5%, and it's, the payments are amortized over 30 years, and it's 30 years, 30 years fixed. Pretty cool loan, right? Well, in commercial, it's not like that. In commercial, you will get a loan that where the payments are amortized for 30 years of payments, but the loan is due in five years. That's the most common loan. Right? Again, payments are amortized over 30, but due in five. And the reason why is banks don't want to be on the hook for 30 years, just in case the neighborhoods change, and, and plus they make a whole lot more money if you have to refinance in five years. Okay, so um, here's the problem. Okay, here's the problem with that. From 2008, if you recall this, from 2008, 2012, I was in right in the middle of this, property values dropped, right? And lenders stopped a lot of lenders said we're not doing anything right now the lending uh, the lending uh, institutions are all messed up and we're gonna stop so it actually uh, it stopped literally stopped for a long time it was very very difficult to get any loan done and some of you that have been around for that long you remember those days right it was very difficult and um, the second problem is many loans that matured then right went into loan default Okay, let me explain that to you. What happened was, if you had a loan that there was a five-year loan, and let's say that you started the loan in 2004, okay? And then in 2009, the loan came due and you had to refinance. You're in the middle of this period. The lender said, no, we're not refinancing. But you go, but I'm 100% occupied. I have a cash flow and uh, there's nothing wrong with my property. The lenders are like, so what? We don't have a loan product for you. So you go to a different lender, same thing. Another lender, same thing. So it was so frustrating. And some of these guys went into loan default and had to give their properties back to the lender because there was no loan for them, okay? Or they would have to sell their property for much cheaper now because of what, what of, because this property drop, you see? And the solution was, well, it could have been to get a longer term loan, right? Again, this is something that we learned, you learn from when you go through several up, ups and downs in the market. And uh, so a long-term loan is not five years, okay? It could be seven, 10, 12, or 30-year loan. Yes, a 30-year fixed commercial loan is available. The interest rates are higher, but these are available. But the most common ones are seven, uh, 10, and 12. Okay, so that's the solution. Now, here's the big question. Big question here is, when will property values drop again? And their answer is, no one knows. I don't know, you don't know. The smartest people in the world have no idea when this is going to happen, right? So to safeguard you from this disaster of going to loan default because you can't refinance because of a market drop is to get long-term debt, long enough to write out market volatility. Got it? All right, let's go to number five. Number five. Buy property that will always be in demand, right? Makes sense. Well, why wouldn't people do that? Well, let me give you an example of something that no longer exists or exists in a very, very uh, diminished uh, uh, capacity. And that is the company called WeWork, right? It's the famous uh, co-sharing, uh, sharing the workspace where people from different companies will get together and uh, they will congregate many different companies in one spot. You heard of the company, right? We were. It was once a forty-seven billion dollar company, right? Back in you know uh, eleven years ago. Nine years later, right? The company is only worth ten percent of what it once was, right? No longer in demand. So it's uh, that that property or that business model is no longer in demand. So don't buy a property like that, right? So here's the big question, right? The big question is what's going to be around? 20, 25 years from today and worth more and still in demand, right? My opinion, it's going to be apartments, mobile home parks, industrial and storage, right? We need the apartments and mobile home parks because everyone needs a place to lay their heads, right, to live. Uh, we need industrial because e-commerce is, no, is not going anywhere, it's just gonna continue to grow, right? And lastly, storage, we need a, a place to put our human stuff our material things. So these three things will always uh, have a need for. So in my opinion, 
when you buy property that will always be in demand and worth more later, this is the ticket right here, these items right here. Okay? All right. Hopefully that made sense for you. Let's finish up by going to number six. All right. Here we are, number six, last but not least, and that is buy existing properties, don't build new. No new construction. Okay? And uh, when, you, when you build something new, new construction, here are the issues, right? And again, we're, are, we're about uh, safeguarding from disaster, okay? So we want to mitigate disasters from happening. So don't build anything new. No new construction. Buy existing properties, properties that are already performing, have tenants, have income, and have cash flow, okay? Here are some of the issues. When you build something new, it can take years to break down. You got to go to the city. You got to get permits, you have to get drawings, you have to get approval, you have to get financing, right? And too many things can go wrong, okay? I've been in this business for over 20 years. I've seen a lot of uh, uh, new build issues come into fray and things, uh, for example, in my own city, things been waiting for over 10 years to get built because of politics or issues with the builder, okay? Number two, you, during, you have to hope that the market de demand remain strong while you're uh, doing your construction, which by the way, construction can take years to complete. So while, while all this is going on, you're hoping that the market dynamics stay the same so that when you're done, you have something uh, that's in demand. Again, you know, in my opinion, uh, too many things can go wrong here. Number three, uh, building new is absolutely not for beginners. In fact, if, if you're a beginner, you're gonna build something new, this is what can happen. It can, it can cause Dane Bramage, right? Oops, I mean brain damage, okay? You see, Dane Bramage, brain damage. So this is what happens uh, if you're new and you try to do this. And lastly, uh, building something new is capital intensive. Capital is the uh, money outlay. So a lot of money needs to go out to build something too. A lot of money needs to go out, okay? So a lot of money go out waiting for things to happen, all right? Again, too many things can go wrong when, when you're deal, dealing with something that's capital intensive, especially if you're a beginner, all right? Okay, that was number six. No new construction, okay? Don't build new, buy existing, already performing properties. All right, all right, so let me uh, recap uh, the six ways to uh, safeguard yourself from disaster in commercialist investing. Number one is have an experienced team, Number two, plenty of cash reserves. Number three, to have a conservative, very conservative extra strategy. Number four is to having long-term debt to write out the volatility. Number five, um, buy something that's always going to be in demand and worth more down the road. And number six, buy existing properties and don't build new, all right? Thank you very much everybody for watching. Thank you for your time. If you like this video, click the like button and uh, hopefully uh, I'll see you in the next video. If you like this video, go to our website, uh, commercialpropertyadvisors.com or simply subscribe to this YouTube channel or just like this video. Thank you so much everyone. I'll see you at the next video.